Hello and welcome to this episode of For Your Consideration. My name is Guy and today we're going to be looking at how to make journeying interesting. Now, if there is one video or film that we can look for or look to as a source of inspiration of how not to do it, it's something like The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings. That film is on record, apart from Lawrence of Arabia, as having one of the most amount of sequences of the characters walking and doing precious little else. So how do we make journeying interesting? Just having great big helicopter shots sweeping over a bunch of extras, wandering around looking like the main characters on top of some mountain in the middle of New Zealand, is not going to cut it in our games. We really don't care that much. So when I look at how to do that, there are a few things that I think that we can bring together that will make it much more interesting. And those four, well, there's four things anyway that came to my mind. And that's encounters, descriptions, checks and challenges, and then surprise discoveries. So I'm gonna unpack those four different things for you to help you to narrate your journey sequences that much better. Now, notice the key thing here is to narrate your journey sequences. If your characters have to travel over long distances on a campaign from A to B and it isn't part of the story, it isn't part of the adventure that you've planned out. So the adventure is happening in the distant temple of Sesruxus Khan. But in order to get there, the adventurers have to travel through the jungles of Akolokal, and the jungles of Akolokal, uh, in order to get to those jungles, they have to travel from one side of the kingdom to the other. The adventure starts when they arrive at the jungle of Akolokal, not beforehand. The, the, the journey to there is unimportant. But you feel the need to have the characters feel this great sense of distance that they've traveled. So they feel really isolated when they arrive at Akawakal and they don't really have immediate backup. I understand that and that's perfectly acceptable tactic to do to really encourage the PCs to plan for this adventure. They really want to know that they are going far away and you want them to feel that as well. So that's absolutely fine. The four methods that I'm going to describe are going to help you make that journey easy without having to do the laborious checks every three seconds and turn what should be maybe a 10 minute moment in your role playing experience and prevent it from becoming an entire session because it can spiral out of control so easily. This is something that I as a GM often encounter as I see where the players are going they think that there is something of value in this journey because I've set it up that they need to go on this journey. So they start to investigate stuff which has nothing to do with the main plot and I end up getting bogged down with an entire adventure set on the journey to get to the actual adventure. Now, one does one's best and of course you try and make that as entertaining a side adventure as you possibly can, but you can avoid it. So let's look at it. So the encounter idea. Absolutely, you can have an encounter. Maybe one, maybe two. But I would suggest that you limit your encounters to literally one or two. I wouldn't have more than that. I also wouldn't have them as random. Yes, you might want to use those random encounter tables, and they've existed for 50 years for a reason. We absolutely understand why they're there. Use them if you like but I prefer to control my encounters. And the encounters basically break down into three different groups. There is adversaries, there's NPCs, and then there's locations. Now those are the three different types of encounters that I will uh, use for my players' uh, vilification as they are moving through this, this terrain to get to their, their point. As far as Adversaries concerned, it could be bandits, it could be a random attack, it could be a middle of a battlefield that they have to travel through, although that does start to hint at sort of adventures and things. So it needs to be localized and it needs to be wrapped up in a very brief space of time. If you have bandits attacking, make sure that the bandit camp is no more than 100 feet away from the road that they were traveling on. So when they invariably go looking for it, they find it straight away and they find that these bandits have only just set up shop. If it's strange creatures, make their lairs nearby. Because I guarantee you, the players are going to want to investigate and they're going to go off and they're going to go and have a look for that thing. And it will suddenly turn out into an emergent adventure, which I talk all about in, in, in another video. 
So watch out for having encounters that lead to more and that leads to more. They can spiral out of control. If you just throw in a random NPC, that's a piece of conversation and you can use that to give them information. They might say that they're off to Akawakal Forest and uh, the NPC says, Oh, Akawakal, yeah, I've got a cousin who lives out there. He lives in one of those walking huts. Very interesting uh, idea about trying to prevent themselves from being eaten by the cannibals. If their village moves around all the time, then um, well, the cannibals can't find them, can they? Now, that might have been an interesting piece of flavouring that you've just made up on the fly, that the villagers of Akawakal Forest or Jungle have mobile houses and homes and things to avoid the cannibals that live in Akawakal. What you have done, however, is you've now created for yourself a gigantic problem. The players are going to stop and go, but we don't know where the village is that we're supposed to meet our point of contact or however you're starting off your adventure in the Akawakal jungles. So you started to give them pause for thought. Now again, that simply delayed their journey towards Akawakal. You want them to get there quickly. So if the NPC says, oh yeah, I've got a cousin who lives in Akawakal. He lives in one of those walking villages. You know, it thwarts the cannibals because they're not very smart, so they can't find the villages. But you can see them a mile away. Just climb up a tree and look for the flags that stick out of the canopy. Mm, leads you straight to them. You can use the trees as a matter of fact just to avoid the entire jungle floor. Well, now there's a piece of useful information. It might feel like you're spoon feeding them information if you do that. So you need to be subtle about it, you need to be careful about it. If it's a trader, maybe it's the trader who's come from that direction. If it's a random farmhand, don't just have a random farmhand talk to the party and not give them anything of value. Why would they talk to them? If it's a friendly wave, that's absolutely fine. But unless there's value in that conversation, unless you're seeding something for a future adventure, don't be tempted to overplay the journey. It's not that important. Now, the locations are fairly interesting that you can throw at people as an encounter. So they can come across a bridge that's being built. They can come across a village that's been burned down. Again, you have to be careful to make sure that you're not giving them any hints or clues as to a potential adventure in the area. You want them to move through. So giving them a location that they suddenly come across, a monolith out in the middle of the field, it might be completely, completely innocuous. It might just be as a bit of flavouring. Absolutely fine. You're seeding that for the future. So you're letting them know that, yes, en route between the capital and Akawakal Forest, there is this strange monolith that was covered completely in black obsidian, but had no detailing on it whatsoever. Detect magic or whatever system you're using didn't detect anything. And so the players' characters had to give up and move on. However, six adventures later, that obelisk has now come alive. What you did was you seeded the obelisk in that first adventure. You didn't let it get in the way because you gave absolutely nothing away. And the players now know about the obelisk. So when you say that the obelisk comes alive, they feel as if they've been involved in the story for a much longer time than they actually have. Something to bear in mind, though, if you are going to deny the characters the ability to advance the potential plot that may have come out of a location or an NPC or a villain encounter, you need to make sure that you tell your players that. You search around the obelisk, but you realize that whoever was here was just too good at hiding their tracks. You don't think you're going to make any headway by continuing to investigate this object. That sentence will save your players a huge amount of frustration. There is nothing worse than being a player and being told there's an obelisk. Aha, the GM's plot hook. Aha, I will go and investigate this obelisk. And as a player, you throw all your skills, all your abilities. You think outside the box. You think inside the box. You turn the box upside down. You become a Schrodinger's cat inside the box. You do everything that you possibly can. And yet the GM just says, you don't find anything, you don't find anything, you don't find anything, you don't find anything. That's an incredibly frustrating experience for the player. Headed off at the very beginning after the first check that the player has made to determine the origin of the obelisk. And by saying, you simply think you cannot find any more because the person who was here was much more skilled at hiding their tracks than you think you uh, currently can detect. 
Ah, uh, all right, the GM has, has given us this weird little location, weird, but we're going to carry on going. And that's all it becomes as a footnote in their memory. So make sure that you let your players know beforehand if you're creating something that they can't really interact with, that they can't really interact with it because the character who was there before is better and more powerful than they are. If we then look at descriptions, so obviously a journey is about a description. And when I think of the journeys that I've personally been on, I've been privileged enough to, to live in a country where the geography is remarkably diverse. We've got deserts, we've got sort of mountains, we've got forests, we've got sea coastlines, we've got open savannah, we've got wildlife. South Africa has got some wonderful, wonderful geography, and I have had the privilege of walking through most of it. As a result, when I look back at the things that stick out in my memory as to, to the things that made that journey interesting, it wasn't the fact that I uh, frequently was unhappy about having to walk great distances or carry my own weight or half my weight on my back in terms of camping equipment and that sort of thing. It was the fact that there were experiences. When I was on top of our tallest sort of mountainous area watching thunderclouds roll in, I remember not remembering that, uh, or not thinking, to figure out how to set the tent up first before going on the hike. So uh, the friend who was with me at the time, he didn't know how to set the tent up either. He'd bought the thing, but he thought I did. Of course, I didn't. So as the thunderstorm smacked us on top of this mountain top, it was a terrific tempest of fury and wind and rain. We had to crawl inside the tent and use it sort of like a bag because the... Um, tent posts and poles and things just didn't want to stay up for whatever reason that night was a terrifically terrible night everything got wet everything got wet because the bag basically acted like a bag and contained a lot of water in it and us by the morning but that sunrise which we were waiting for before we could start climbing down the mountain to go and get into our vehicles and drive to the nearest warm space that mountain in the morning, when that sunlight, because we were waiting for it, we were waiting for it, when it started to peak over those mountains and there's that funny hazy purple light where you can sort of see things but it's just not comfortable enough to start moving around and the calmness and the stillness of that and that scent of everything being freshly cleaned because of this rain that had scourged the top of the mountain that is what reminds me of that adventure. The way that the tent was being picked up by the wind and rocked about and we had to hold it down. It wasn't difficult with me inside the tent. It would have to be a significant amount of wind to make it move too far. But the wind was picking up the tent, which would open up the flap and cause the rain to gush in. And oh, it, was a, it was absolutely horrendous. But that's what I'm talking about, is the senses were engaged. When I think about walks that I used to take along the river, again, it's the smell of that fresh cut grass. It's the feeling of, of nervousness as you're pushing through the bulrushes because those blades on those uh, bulrushes, the, the leaves themselves are very, very sharp and you can cut yourself so easily uh, on them. And that cold, cool water and the slimy rocks underneath it. So if you're going to be doing descriptions about journeys, I suggest you take a few so that you can get these memories. I mean, we've all gone on journeys, even when you walk to the shop. What's the experience that goes through your mind? Like the other day, now that I'm in Japan, there's very little greenery in the greater Tokyo area, apart from neat little um, trees, things here and there. But I pass under an underpass. There's a massive train system and the under undercarriage of that. There was a thistle bush that has been growing uh, since the beginning of of uh, spring I suppose and it had those beautiful purple flowers on it and now those flowers have turned into those wonderful little uh, floating seed pods which drift around on the air current so easily and so 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 lightly and almost dance around if you like. And the other day I was walking back from them hot as Hades out here and these things are just quietly drifting, dancing around, uh, looking for all the world like a bunch of fairies in mating season. It was really, really quite spectacular. So when you're doing descriptions, engage your five senses. Think about how you can apply them and give your characters, give your players a description. 
Again, though, do not give them 20 descriptions. That's not what makes the journey exciting. You remember one or two things that are key. The rest you don't need to worry about. So if they're moving over vast amounts of different types of geography, try and engage the senses for each of those different types of geography. So if they're moving through mountains, perhaps you can talk about the coldness of the air in the mountains. If they're moving through uh, river areas, talk about the mosquitoes that sting and that bite so that you're engaging touch. If they're moving through forests, talk about the sounds that you hear, the softness of your boots as they crunch over leaf litter that's decades old, and that, that incredible sense of living that seems to be going on, but you can't see any of it. So engage the senses if you're going to be doing descriptions and draw on your own journeys. That's the important thing. Now, checks and challenges. It depends on what sort of system you're using, but most systems have got some kind of survival or nature or tracking or guide uh, skill or natural knowledge nature or something along those lines, which allows people to make checks of their surroundings. Again, I wouldn't bombard them with hundreds and hundreds of checks. Checks really take you out of the narrative sort of experience, but they can build tension for the players, which is a benefit. So have them make some checks, but the checks don't really need to succeed or fail. Those checks are merely to simulate the environment. So a, a jumping check or an agility check as they have to cross some rivers and streams and the laughter when the dwarf doesn't make it and so his boots are wet. That's the total ramification of it, to create these little moments of memory on the journey. And then that's it. Don't don't make it a huge amount of checking. Um, the forest, Axacotl or whatever the, 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 the place is called, uh, the forest is going to have all kinds of dangers and checks and things. And that's your next journey that you're going on. So you don't want to overshadow that by the significant journey that they're going on. And then finally, surprise discoveries. Now, surprise discoveries are things that your players come across that are just moments. Now they are really a kind of a combination of all of the other elements that we've spoken about so far, but they are things like a spectacular sunset over the glass plains, which is grass that the seed pods become translucent in a certain temperature, and as the sun is setting, those seed pods on top of the grasses, because they're all translucent, they create this mirror-like effect. And it looks like a sea of glass, and it's just beautiful for a moment. And the elk that are feeding on the grass look as if they're actually swimming across this pristine lake, but in this bizarre hybridized Rorschach test of some kind, as they mirrored moments. You can also have them come across a secret door that's sealed completely. It's in a wall that's crumbled. The other side of the wall, the door isn't there, so the door clearly goes somewhere, but it's magically sealed, or there's a curse written above the door frame. Uh, it could be that they come across a fantastical creature, something that's not aggressive, it's not an NPC, it's not really a monster, it's not going to attack them, but it's a unicorn in a forest glade. It's a silver fish that is swimming, but swimming about four inches above the water of the river. And when it sees the characters, it suddenly drops into the water and disappears off under the rocks. It's a magical moment, to, again, just to punctuate the journey so that when the players sit back, they go, oh, you know, um, that adventure in the jungles was terrifying. But do you, do you remember that journey that we took to get there where we saw the three-headed whatever or where the sunset was absolutely golden or... That's what you're looking to do when you're, when you're doing a journey montage, is to create a moment that the players can latch onto and really, really relish as far as that. You do not want your players to go, oh my God, and then we spent three sessions walking. I have spoken about this before, I know, but it is a bugbear of mine. Don't just have them walk inch by inch, grid block by grid block on your map. Get them to where they need to be and punctuate it with some amazing moments. And you will be surprised at how eager your players are to go on more journeys. Until next time, I hope this video has been useful. If it has been, hit that like button. If you want to see more on this kind of discussion-y sort of thing, hit the subscribe button. Next week, we're looking at um, some very interesting uh, things. There's a book that I have been sent about a setting. 
a rather remarkable setting and a rather remarkable game system as well. So that is something to look forward to. Until next time, however, head on over to rpgtablefinder.com and uh, they uh, it's a website that we've created to allow you to link up with players all over the world. You can join our Patreon, for example, as another way of supporting the channel, but also getting access to adventures that come out every month, illustrations, maps, all kinds of wonderful things um, that we share with our Patreon as well as access to the Patreon Facebook community where everybody helps everybody out and uh, talks and shares ideas and throws out adventure options and discusses it and develops it and takes it even further. So head on over to our webpage www.greatgamemaster.com where you can find how to join the Patreon movement and uh, come and uh, have fun with us on the, on the uh, groups there. Until next time, however, I wish you and yours the happiest of gaming. Mm -hmm.